Tea and antiques go hand in hand. You've got tea related antiques at home from tea pots, tea cups and tea caddies. But do you know the history of tea? I bet you don't. You do not appreciate tea like you should because the history of tea is shocking. It involves murder, mayhem, smuggling and money laundering. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read my chapter to you all about the history of tea in front of this stunning village on the northeast coast of England called Robin Hood's Bay. And the reason I'm here, or well, one, it's gorgeous, and two, this was a smuggler's paradise. So whilst I show you around the village, let's go for a walk, I'll read you my section on tea drinking and the history of tea. Let me know what you think. Cheers. Here we have then Robin Hood's Bay on the northeast coast of England. I'm going to walk you down this steep hill into the village and you'll get a sense of what the place looked like during the 18th century, the Georgian period, when this was a hot spot for smugglers. Now, the village itself, legend has it, is named after the famous Robin Hood, who was around in the 13th century. So here we go. Let's go for a walk. You'll see, you know, hundreds of tourists. Just, though, imagine what it might have been like during the Georgian period when smugglers were abound. Here's my chapter on tea from my book, A Romp with the Georgians. The chapter is titled, Anyone for Tea? Now, let me tell you about one of the things the Georgians loved to do during the day if they had the time and the money. They liked to drink tea. Tea came from China and it was exorbitantly expensive. We just do not appreciate a good cup of tea these days. It's cheap and plentiful now. Anybody can afford it. And when something becomes so inexpensive, it loses its status in society. But go back to the Georgian period, the early days of that period. Just one teaspoon of tea at that time was worth the average weekly wage of a servant girl. So, bearing in mind a servant was given board and lodgings, they might earn around equivalent of about 50 to 100 pounds a week in today's terms. So a pot of tea for four would require four teaspoons of tea, plus one teaspoon for the pot, making the cost of a pot of tea in today's terms at least £250. No wonder then, servants had a dreadful reputation for stealing tea. Today, I doubt you'd give tea a second thought. You prepare it on autopilot, you don't wonder where it came from, you don't savour the taste and the aroma like you would, say, a terribly expensive bottle of wine, you just have no appreciation of it whatsoever. That's what I think. I think this is a terrible thing. The Georgians, however, were, as you can imagine, much more appreciative of tea because it was so expensive. They understood it far better than we do. And in the rich households, those who could afford it, they experimented with mixing their own blends of tea. White tea, black tea and green tea, which they'd then show off to their friends at tea parties. And the recipes of their own homegrown blends would be guarded jealously. So this was the beginning of the British love affair with tea. In the early days, though, only a tiny percentage of the population could actually afford tea. So the masses could only wonder at what the drink tasted like. Tea was a luxury only for the uber-rich. Tea was first introduced to Britain in the 17th century by Charles II's wife, Catherine of Braganza. An exotic sounding name for an exotic woman who was born and brought up in Portugal. Apparently though, when she landed in England for the very first time, she arrived at her lodgings and called for a cup of tea. This was an unusual drink to the English. So unusual, in fact, that no one knew what the drink was. The courtiers and servants ran around the place desperately searching for something called tea. But they got completely confused and brought her instead a pint of beer. Catherine, from then on, made sure that there was a future supply of tea and it soon caught on. By the time of the Georgians, 50 years or so after its introduction, 
tea had rooted itself in high society where it was kept under strict lock and key due to its value. And of course, because of the value, small canisters, what we now call tea caddies, were made specifically to house the precious commodity and keep the leaf safe and crucially dry. As you can imagine, I've handled many of these little tea caddies over the years and they're beautiful objects indeed. Now, I've always believed that the closest you will ever get to traveling through time is holding an object from the past that has not changed in centuries. These tea caddies are wonderful examples of objects that really can transport you back in time. They're just little mini time capsules that sit in the palm of your hand and of course they're exquisitely made. Lift the lids and sometimes you can even smell the past. The aroma of the Georgian tea has lingered for centuries. Because the caddies were so highly prized and cherished in their day, most have survived and their direct connections to people long gone and forgotten. Direct connections to those real Georgians, our ancestors. All caddies had locks and a key, no matter how tiny the canisters were. The key for the caddy was generally kept in a very safe place by the lady of the house, away from thieving fingers. Well, you would, wouldn't you? Now, in many cases, the lady wore the key around her neck as a pendant, a bit of a show off, really, making sure that the servants didn't get a chance to grab the key and pinch a teaspoon or two of the precious cargo. As you might imagine, with tea being so expensive, there were people and companies making eye-watering sums of money out of importing and distributing tea, as well, of course, as the government raking in huge tax revenues. Tea was a cash cow. But whenever there's a market stuffed full of cash and massive profits, that market can become shady, to say the least. It opens up the opportunity for all sorts of criminality, tax avoidance and shenanigans, even murder. Tea is not as innocent as one might think. Just for a moment, let's take a look at the tea imitations. That's right, the fake teas, the dodgy teas, the adulterated teas and the downright poisonous teas. Yes, some tea actually killed you. Unscrupulous tea dealers soon came up with a great ruse, and that was to simply reuse and resell old tea leaves. So what they do is they'd simply collect the soggy leftover tea leaves and dry them out. The leftovers, though, didn't look very much like fresh tea. So to make them look authentic, the dealers would mix in a quantity of new leaves to fluff up the old mix. On top of this, to save some money on the real tea, that include leaves from other plants and almost anything they could find that resembled a tea leaf. They'd then blend the ingredients with a little added copper or lead for colour and cleverly pass it off as real tea to unsuspecting buyers. And inexperienced tea drinkers, of course, then thought they were getting a great discounted deal. Then there was a particularly horrid blend of tea which became known as British tea, a terrible concoction made up of British indigenous leaves like elder, hawthorn and ash, all mingled together and brewed in the same way as real tea. But, as you might imagine, the taste never matched that of the real thing. To its credit, it was very cheap, but by all accounts it tasted horrific. It also had the terrible reputation for poisoning people. Eventually, British tea production was banned by the British government. Let's have a quick walk on the beach. Now back to the tea. Possibly the best or worst example of adulterated tea was the type where the mix of leaves, old and new, along with fake local leaves, were jumbled up and then left to soak for a period of time in a large tub of sheep's dung and water, two highly unhealthy ingredients. 
Periodically, it was stirred, and then this was allowed to marinate for a couple of days out in the open, giving the mix time to develop a distinctive colour and <laughs> aroma. Finally, the slush was drained from the leaves, and they were then thoroughly dried out. They were packaged up and sold as genuine tea from China. One Georgian tea merchant commented at the time that some tea dealers with the mixes they were putting together could be described as secret assassins, ready to enter the home of any man and poison him and his family in the pursuit of profit. Not much changes. And all of this because of the cost of tea. Now, one of the reasons why tea was so very expensive was due to government taxation. The Treasury was raking in huge amounts of cash from the tea tax, which was set at over 100%. So the more people lapped up tea, the more the government coffers were bulging. And to help keep a control on the price of tea and in turn keep the taxes high, the government gave sole rights of tea importation into Britain from China to the East India Company. Keeping the price high was in the East India Company's interest too. More profit for them, even though they were paying the government huge tax money on every tonne of tea they landed in British ports. They too were cash rich. The tea trade was a stitch up between the company and the government. It was a bit of a racket. The government and the East India Company obviously liked the idea of the status quo, and so they colluded to keep it that way. The tea fakers weren't having much of an impact on their lucrative arrangement, so not much sleep was lost there. But there was another group of people who became major irritants and who for decades cost the government and the East India Company massive sums of cash. They were the tea smugglers. And some of those smugglers lived here, in these streets, in Robin Hood's Bay. Avoiding the tea tax and the East India Company ships, the inventive smugglers, also known as organised crime groups, bought tea from the Dutch and others who were trading with China. Then they would smuggle it into the country. All around the coast of Britain, untaxed tea was pouring in illegally. The smugglers, initially bringing the tea in under the cover of darkness to be sold on the black market. But as the trade grew, so much money was being made that more and more people in the seaside villages were getting involved in the illegal tea trade. Therefore, with so many locals on side, the smugglers became increasingly confident and quite open in their business. They started smuggling tea during daylight, increasing the amount of tea they could put into the market. Traditional workers drawn into a life of crime. They were putting down their agricultural tools and leaving the fields. Fishermen were no longer going out to sea, or working the rivers, and cottage industries were losing workers to the smuggling gangs. It was just more profitable. All of them getting involved in the highly lucrative business of transporting and handling illegal tea. The tea smugglers also smuggled tobacco and brandy, of course, but tea was the product of choice. It was light, easy to transport, and the demand for it was insatiable. It didn't take long before at least 50% of all tea consumed in Britain was smuggled and illegal. And the two biggest players in the business, the government and the East India Company, were seriously fed up with the situation, both suffering financially. The smuggling gangs themselves, in some cases, were huge firms owning warehouses, ships and really well-organised transportation. Their employees, including bribed officials, of course, were all happy to be earning more from the illicit tea trade than they could ever earn anywhere else. Inevitably, of course, when there's huge amounts of money involved, things could turn very nasty. With competition and rival gangs, the smugglers soon developed a terrible reputation for violence, intimidation and bribery, all because of tea. <laughs> 
Kidnappings and killings were not uncommon, and any employee or bribed bureaucrat who turned and gave evidence against the gangs could quite easily disappear, never to be seen again. And all levels of society were involved from the bottom to the very top. And just like the drug trade today, the illegal tea business traded on cash and, crucially, fear. Many of the seemingly upstanding and approved London tea merchants who held legal, tax-paid teas bought from the East India Company were also dealing directly and at the same time with the illegal smuggling gangs. This group were part of the white-collar criminals of the illicit tea trade, being both tax avoiders and money launderers. So the two types of tea, the legal and the illegal, were now mixed up in the distribution networks and the teas were being moved around the country at will. Far inland and to all corners of the country, if you could afford it, you had access to tea. Right at the bottom of the chain, you've got the workers for the criminal gangs, committing all sorts of crimes, including murder. And at the top of the chain, you have the end users, those in polite high society, happily encouraging the trade, the carnage and avoiding tax. Of course, that was the whole idea. But think about that for a moment. It's not unlike people today spending large sums of money on smuggled illegal drugs. It was no different knowing full well that they were funding terrible crimes and suffering. But let's forget for a moment about the criminality and let's spare a thought for the poor East India Company and the British government. Both had been fighting the tea smugglers throughout the 18th century and both, in spite of their massive resources, failed miserably to combat them. It was a battle that lasted over 80 years and one which seemingly would never end. There was just too much money involved. Whenever a smuggler was caught, convicted, imprisoned or executed, another would take his or her place. Remember, smuggling was a meritocracy. It didn't matter what sex you were. If you were a good smuggler, you were a good smuggler. It, as ever, was all about the cash and the lifestyle it generated. The temptation to smuggle was just too great. The East India Company was suffering because the terrible smugglers, of course, were not buying their tea from them, which reduced their market share. And to add insult to injury, the criminals were undercutting them in the market too. Even worse than that, there came a point when the tea smugglers were doing more business than the East India Company. To the government, the smugglers, the dealers, and in fact the end users in their posh parlours drinking illicit tea were nothing more than criminals, tax avoiders and money launderers who were unpatriotically, to say the least, taking the bread from the mouth of His Majesty's government. For many years, in an attempt to end the illegal trade, a body known as the Anti-Tea Tax Lobby, which was funded by the East India Company, had been pleading with the government to slash the tea tax, which was now set at 119%. The lobby argued that by drastically reducing the tax on importation, tea prices on the street, in the shops and tea rooms would drop so drastically that legal tax-paid tea could then compete if not actually undercut the smuggled illegal tea and therefore potentially close the smuggling gangs down. But for decades, the government rejected this idea, saying that it would reduce their tax revenue too much and put the very government finances in jeopardy. It was a standoff and an argument that painfully lingered on for generations, with no one being able to put the smugglers out of business. Finally exasperated and fighting a losing battle with the criminals, the government 
gave in. And in 1784, under huge pressure from the East India Company, at the stroke of a pen, they slashed the tea tax from its 119%, you think you've got tax problems, to 12.5% overnight. The government, though, were so worried that the reduction in tea tax would have a detrimental, if not dangerous, downward effect on the national income that to compensate they decided to put up the window tax. This was a tax levied on homeowners who had more than seven windows in their houses. Every window over the seven carried a tax over and above the already existing window tax. Also known as the light tax, homeowners were already feeling the squeeze of the tax on their windows, but they were an easy, quite literally, sitting target for the Chancellor's office to claw back any reductions in earnings from the tea tax. The majority of property owners, their arms twisted, paid up, but others took drastic measures to avoid it. They simply bricked up windows in their homes, bringing their window numbers down to avoid it. Many windows, as I'm sure you've noticed, even to this day, have not yet been reinstated. The window tax was abolished in 1851. The reduction in the tea tax had an immediate and much desired effect. The East India Company and their lobby group had been right all along. Overnight, the cost of legitimate tea was drastically reduced. Legal tea could now compete and even beat the price of smuggled tea. The tea merchants sitting in their warehouses no longer wanted or needed to deal with the criminal smugglers. The dealers could now buy all of their tea legally at the same price or less than the illegal tea and not run, of course, the risk of being arrested or prosecuted. So in a short period of time, the smuggling gangs were completely taken out of the tea business. An unexpected side effect of this new tax rate was the huge increase in the purchase of tea because tea was now legally much cheaper. It opened it up to a far greater market. Many people previously couldn't afford to buy the heavily taxed tea, obviously, or they actually didn't want to get involved with the smugglers or anything illegal. So they'd refused to buy the tea on the black market. But now the masses got to taste tea. They loved it and they were soon addicted. Another quite surprising, pleasing side effect was extra money for the British government. Even though the tea tax was only 12.5%, because of the enormous increase in tea sales, the government tax revenue was soon far greater than it had been when the tax was set at 119%. The windfall on top of the higher window tax meant the government were quids in and no doubt wishing that they'd procrastinated less and changed the tax decades earlier. And as for the East India Company, well, they were ecstatic. What a result. They were now paying less tax on their imports of tea and selling much more of the stuff than they'd ever done before, which meant bigger profits and very happy shareholders. So this all meant that the employees of the smuggling gangs, well, they had to migrate back to the fields, the sea, the rivers and the cottage industries. But whatever happened to the smugglers, you may ask? Well, some retired, some concentrated on alternative and much in demand commodities at the time, like smuggled liquor and tobacco, and some even took to the roads. They became highwaymen, a very profitable, if risky, career during the 18th century. And tea, which, as we can now see, is not nearly as innocent as we once thought, was, of course, responsible for the Boston Tea Party in 1773. There's a little special for my American subscribers. The tea tax there was the spark that set that particular tinderbox alight and which then began the American War of Independence. Put it down to tea. <laughs>